Today's guest is Etheria. She is a psychic medium and trans channel that has been abducted both by benevolent and hostile extraterrestrials. And tonight we're going to learn about her experiences. Etheria, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast this evening. Hi, thanks for having me here. And I want to show all your people my shirt. I've already shown you, but Mm -hmm. I I wore this today to be fitting. (laughs) And it is awesome. Where is Manitou <laughs> Springs, Colorado? Uh, Manitou Springs is, uh, it is, ne- it's so it's south of Denver. It's actually a little west of, um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the town, about an hour south of Denver. Uh, what is um, that? But it's, about, it's about an hour south of Denver and then up, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a new way, it's a metaphysical woo-woo town. That's a woo-woo town. Do they have? Do they have any alien? It's a woo-woo town. <laughs> have they had any alien contact there since they have it on their shirt? Uh, I'm gonna. I don't know details, but I'm gonna assume so because um, they have an air force base near there, mm-hmm. and I've heard some other stories, so I think so. Mm, cool. Yeah, I think so. All right. So correct me if I am wrong. You were getting some type of treatment from Doctor Pearl. And that's when you first found out about your extraterrestrial experience. Is that correct? Uh, actually, well, there were signs of it during my sessions with Eric in 1996. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, um, stuff didn't get weird in terms of alien stuff, really, until 98. So um, what happened, is, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible because it's way too long of a story. But mm-hmm. in 1995, I got a severe neck injury mm-hmm. and it was causing really, really bad pain, which I still deal with. Um, so that was in ni- October 95. And then in the summer of 96, I went out for coffee one day with a friend and she knew the amount of pain that I was in. And I didn't know what to do because I was I didn't have a stable job and everything at the time. And, uh, and she's like, I think you need to go to this chiropractor. She says, he's not a regular chiropractor, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but she didn't really elaborate. She's like, he's a little special. And so she, you know, she wrote down his name and number and stuff. But to be honest, I, I didn't feel like I could spend money to go to anybody at that point. I was really making very little money. Mm -hmm. So I took his name and number, set it aside around. And then a couple of weeks later, um, There on Sunday nights, there in Los Angeles, this is Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, there was um, kind of a holistic type show on the on the radio at 9 p.m. every Sunday night. And I kept meaning to tune in, but every single Sunday I would forget. And all of a sudden, this this was a few weeks after she'd given me Eric's name and number and said I should go see him. All of a sudden at 8:59 p.m. on this Sunday night. Um, radio pops. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm scared you. You know, radio pops into my head, and it was. I, I now realize it was guidance. I didn't understand. I was psychic at that point, and um, so I go, "Oh, it's nine o'clock." You know, so I rush, turn the radio on. Well, as fate would have it, Eric was the guest that evening. Mm. And he, you know, they start interviewing him. And I think I heard him say about 30 seconds worth of something. And some in my being, I'm like, a theory. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Well, back then I wasn't a theory yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to go see him. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's a lot of money. And, and you know, I, 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 was, I was debating. I was being cheap. And. But I was fascinated by hearing Eric talk. I couldn't like leave the radio. So I, the show ended, set it aside. Like by the next day or two later, I had this obsessive feeling I had to go see Eric. So um, I go, I don't, you know, I got to cough up the money and go. I need to go. So um, I don't know if he still works this way because this was back in 96. And I know his life has changed a lot. But um, so he liked to work three times in a row. He found that to be more effective with people. And I, at this point, I still didn't know what, what I was going even to have done. I just knew that he was a chiropractor, mm-hmm. but that he's special. So, uh, you know, I go to see him. So we scheduled three days in a row. And uh, uh, now this is kind of funny because he told me, 
because I didn't know what to expect. He's like, uh, he didn't want to color what I was going to experience. So he didn't tell me a lot. And he's like, just go with whatever you feel. Don't hold anything back. Um, don't edit, just relax and be, you know, and lay on the table and, you know, stuff. We'll, we'll see what happens. So I go, okay. You know, cause I didn't know. And, and my life hadn't gotten super weird yet. So I'm, I'm laying there. Well, he starts waving his hands over me and my eyes are closed and stuff. And well, I got this, this bubbling up of giggling from the depths of my being hmm. just was like profusely oozing out of my body. But bliss, I, I think I experienced what you hear about from yogis and stuff as bliss. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the only word I can think of to explain this sense of giggling, this uncontrollable joy. Um, but I'm thinking he's going to think I'm making fun of him or something. So mm -hmm. I didn't think it was appropriate to laugh. I didn't know what to do. So I was like holding it in. So I'm, mm -hmm. yeah, my eyes are closed. I'm, I'm holding this in. And um, so then, so that's how it started. So the session started off with this blissful, giggling, unbelievable stuff that I was holding in that I shouldn't have done. Um, but as the session went on, um, I would feel uh, hands touching me where Eric was not standing. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, and I would peek occasionally. I would like open an eye and take a look to see where he was because I would feel hands on my feet, but Eric was standing at my head mm -hmm. or vice versa. So I would feel hands touching me that weren't his. Um, I would feel wind, really strong wind. Um, I would, with my eyes closed, I would have like eyes flying at my face, just close-ups of eyes flying at my, in, in my, with my closed eyes, I could see these eyes flying at my face. Um, the room would get bright, it would you know, get really, really bright and then darker. Um, actually the coolest sensation that I had, uh, and this, this might've been maybe during the, the first or second of the three sessions. I don't remember now. So it's, a, it's all a blur, but, um, I felt myself spiraling inside my own body. I would have to call my body a shell at that point, but I'm spiraling my, all of me was spiraling this way inside myself. Um, to be honest, that was probably my chakras spinning and I sensed it that the way that I did, you know, um, <clears throat> but um, more than one time I went through a tunnel. So it is, it was kind of similar to a lot of near death experience type situations because mm -hmm. I did feel myself go through a tunnel. Mm. Um, usually I would kind of like go through a tunnel feeling and then, but not really go anywhere um, and then be back or whatever. But I did a couple of times feel myself lift up out of my body uh, towards the ceiling and then would come back down. But the one time, and I, was this the third session or the second? I'm forgetting now, but um I did go through the tunnel and that time, this is where the ETs come in. That time I was plopped out into the middle of the universe somewhere. There were beings with me that were, they were standing behind me and we were talking telepathically. Um, I had no desire to like turn around and look and because I think it didn't really matter. I mean, you know, I'm, interpreting this as a physical being, but this was beyond physical, but so I didn't, I didn't turn around, but they were like behind me, we were talking and they showed me a star cluster, probably millions of light years in the distance, I'm going to assume. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, it's going to make me cry again. <laughs> um, I was hit with such immense homesickness. I can't even put it into words. 
I cannot. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, now I'm tingling. And I'm just like, <laughs> this is like I'm reliving that, but I'm also tingling. I think someone's here in spirit right now. Um, mm-hmm. But I, you know, I was born and raised in New York and I moved to California when I was 18. I've never felt tied to anywhere physical here on the planet. So I, I've never felt homesick, homesickness like I felt when I saw this place. And um, I, uh, I became hysterically crying mm. to the point where Eric is like, what's going, you know, he mm. was kind of nervous. So mm. I, I think, and, and curious, and he's like, what's going on, what's going on. And I was crying so hard. I, uh, I couldn't speak. Mm. I couldn't get any words out. I couldn't, you know, so mm. I, I had to tell him afterward. Mm-hmm. Um, so they showed me this place way ahead. Um, and they go, um, we know, you don't like where you are, but you're, you have work to be doing there and you're not done. And we want you to know that we're going to be with you from now on um, to help you. And um, we're not showing you this to upset you, but we just want you to know that we will be bringing you home when you're done. Mm-hmm. And then uh That was pretty much it, if memory serves me correctly. And then it was like whoosh, and I was pulled back to the tunnel, and then I was back on the table um, and could tell Eric kind of what was going on after I calmed down a little bit. But it was soul-level homesickness. This is not like, gee, I miss Rochester. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, this was different. It's like, it's, yeah, it was powerful. So so that was a that was a powerful moment, and then um, so the first two sessions with Eric, I had a lot of um, you know the sensation, the physical sensations, and the lights and the heat and the cold and stuff that you know was really interesting. But I thought eh, I'm still the same person, you know. This is still me. Um, but during the third session. Uh, I don't remember that one a lot. I don't remember a lot of that one actually. But what I do remember is when we got towards the end of that session, Eric, uh, we took because he would take notes after each session. Mm-hmm. So he got my feedback, and then he gave me some feedback. And what the interesting part is, he said he felt um, right here on me. He said there's something going on with you right here. He said I was very drawn to this area which was a little odd because like it's not as close to my main damage, but it's not totally there. Um, and, oh, well, okay, this is worth mentioning. Now, keep in mind, um, this is a good example of we may have our intentions and our expectations, but uh, God, the great spirit, whatever you want to call, you know, the, the power that's out there has its agenda for what's in, what needs to be accomplished in us. So I had gone to Eric for healing from my neck and head damage that I had, that I've now had three different injuries for. Mm-hmm. It's very karmic and I've been killed by my neck numerous times, mm-hmm. but I had two other physical problems that I wasn't thinking about. They were chronic. I had a, 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 a bad breast lump and some female problems. And, um, but they weren't my, they weren't my concern at that point. The pain in my head was my concern. So I don't think I even told him about those. I, you know, but interestingly enough, and this may be TMI, but I have an open book. Um, I, uh, like with the female issues, um, I'd gone many years without getting periods. Like I shouldn't have been getting them and 28 days to the day which is a cycle for all the women out there. Women, the women know this. Mm. Um, I got a period. Mm. He waved his hands over me 28 days later. I suddenly got a period for the first time in years. Mm-hmm. The lump in my breast shrank within three days. The lump shrank by two thirds, mm. at least two thirds to three quarters. So those things that I wasn't even thinking about <laughs> got like better. So now I'm, I guess sidetracked. I'm sorry. So, um, so anyway, so he felt, uh, something happening here that on that third session, I go home that night. Um, I fell asleep 
I had a major out of body experience. I don't remember where I went, but I know that I was out. Well, the only way that I know that I was out of my body is what happened is in the middle of the night, I slammed back into my body with so much force. And I, interestingly enough, I came in through here. I entered in that same section where Eric had said he felt something going on. So I slammed in through here and it threw me half off my bed. I ended up like half on the floor with my legs, like in the bed going, ow, and it hurt. (laughs) And I'm like, ow. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so it was a mixture of ow and what the heck was that? I am like, I have no idea what just happened. And so I, th- at that point, I'm a little nervous. So I'm in my little apartment. I lived in a studio apartment in, in Hollywood. And I'm like, I don't know what just happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm a little nervous. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I get back in bed and I kind of pull my covers up here. Because I'm looking around, I'm looking around the apartment. I'm very am, so I'm very animated. So I'm looking around the apartment, going, "I'm not alone." I could feel people watching me. I felt like there was about a hundred people in my room, and I fully expected at that point, because things were already pretty weird, that um, I'm going to suddenly see people. <laughs> you know, I, I, it was that strong of a feeling like I'm being stared at. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking around the room going, you know, but I didn't see anything. Somehow I fell back to sleep. I don't know how in retrospect, but uh, I woke up the next morning different. I was not the person I had been up until like those three sessions with Eric and I started, um, I started having visions. I started hearing voices. I started knowing things that I shouldn't be able to know through regular logical means. I started feeling uh, energies near me. I, you know, so that all this kind of stuff happened. And um, now. Going way back, I, just, I think Eric blew open my chakras. This is like the only way that I can explain. He infused me with so much energy. It just popped open some abilities that I already had. Because mm-hmm. my mom says that when I was about really young, like I was four years old, um, I'd be in my bedroom at night talking, 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 talking. And she'd get up and say, are you okay? What's going on? And this was in Rochester, New York. And I would point and go, oh, yeah, I'm talking to my Indian friends. And she's like, <laughs> this is what? Yeah. what? What Indian friends? So, um, but I don't remember any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do know that as a kid, I, uh, I did have some dreams come true occasionally, but mm-hmm. I never considered myself psychic. I don't remember being abducted or anything. And mm-hmm. so, so things dramatically changed. Right. Because of Eric in ninety six. Right. Let me ask so, you this. So anyway, so after Eric, yeah. Sounds like he did energy work when you said he was yeah, waving yeah. his hands over you and stuff. <laughs> did he do any of the traditional chiropractic stuff? Um, it was only I think it was the very first session. Um, he actually did do some neck work on me. It was extremely painful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was yeah, he really mm-hmm. it, it was it was bad. But other than, uh, so the first session he did do a little bit of chiropractic too, um, but not no more after that. It was all just energy work. At that point, this was at the beginning. You know, this was closer to the beginning of his journey. He's quite well known now, and mm-hmm. and uh, but this was back in the mid '90s when it, you know, so he was still trying to figure out what he had. You know, mm-hmm. so he was you know he was testing the waters a little bit. And that's why he took a lot of notes because he was studying a lot of us. So. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I was one of the people that had some pretty dramatic things happen. So, so he worked on me three times in a row back then. Um, and then over the next couple of years, um, if he had time in his schedule or whatever, at like maybe every six months or so, he would call me up and say, Hey, you want to come over and play? Hmm. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And I'm like, yeah, go. So, cause things got weird with each session, things got more and more awesome. 
Right. And then, uh, and Eric, well, Eric is the one who turned me on to um, mold, uh, Moldavite. I don't know if you, you know about the crystal Moldavite. <sighs> is it black or is it a crystal? Well, it's like, it's dark, dark, dark green. Yeah. So it can look black in certain right. lighting. Yeah, but it's it's really dark green. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I used to have some. I still may have and, some somewhere. Well, it's very. Um, so he's the one who told me to go get some because yeah. uh, it's it's very extraterrestrial connected. Right. And at that point, like, so he told me because of the the numerous things that I had happened during sessions with him, um, I think he suspected. I'm. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he. I think you know he probably guessed that. I was connected like he is. And mm -hmm. so he told me to read the book Bringers of the Dawn by mm -hmm. Barbara Marciniak right. uh, about, Pleiadi about Pleiadians, wonderful book. So he told me to go read that book. Um, I did. And it was, I was fascinated by it. I had never heard of Pleiadians at that point. Um, I couldn't put the book down. In fact, I, I still may have it here somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but uh so he's so in '96 all this started, right? But then it was night for some reason. 1998 was just a really big year. I had a lot of stuff happen in '98. I was gonna say, and yeah. that's in my. I was gonna. Yeah, I'm so go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, because I think you were gonna go right there, anyways. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go there. No, I mean probably. I don't know, but I, mean, I don't want to keep cutting you off. Um, so 98 is when I had my first abduction that I know about. I do. I suspect now I probably have been abducted my whole life mm. and I just don't know about it and remember it. But a 98 was the one that I recall. Well, the first one. Um, so the, in 98 is when Taos started appearing in my life everywhere. Um, I was meditating one day. And suddenly heard, you are not really Carrie Ryan, you are Ethereum. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, it was this loud voice. So I look up and I'm going, I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And I, because I didn't understand what they said. And they go, you are not really Carrie Ryan, you are Ethereum. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I, I go, spell it. Because I couldn't, I didn't, you know, it wasn't recognizable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I say, spell it. And this voice just goes A T H E R I A. Wow. And I'm like, I go, well, that's interesting, but I'm not changing my name. Uh -huh. And um, well, oh shoot. See, this is like all out of order now. But well, not totally out of order. Um, so just with the name thing, where I have to go is four years before, probably 94. I'm gonna guess 94-ish. I had gone to a psychic in Los Angeles for a reading one day who had been referred to very highly recommended. And uh, he was by referral only. I still miss that man. He was so special. Um, I showed up at his front door in Hollywood one day at this little house and uh, he answers the door and he had no way to research me to know all the things he ended up knowing about me. But um he shook my hands as, you know, you know, hi, you know, nice to meet you. And I said, my name was Carrie at the time. And he's, and he stops and he goes, you need to change your name. Hmm. And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> he goes, he says, your name is so wrong for you. It's literally causing you harm and you hmm. need to change your name. And I thought, well, okay, that's interesting, but mm -hmm. I'm fine the way I, you know, I liked my name. I, yeah. So I forgot about it. So, so this is four years before. And then all of a sudden you're not really who you think you are. You're a thing. Mm. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not changing my name to Etheria. That's too weird. Mm. It's, it's too, you know, it's exotic. I don't feel exotic. It sounds like a goddess. I'm certainly not a goddess. I don't know. So uh, I didn't actually accept the name Etheria until the spring of, 99 and this whole name goes to the whole et thing in a minute too mm -hmm. um because in the spring of 99 um i started getting this obsessive feeling that i had to change my name 
And I kept going, no, it's a weird name. And I can't, I can't, I, I can't, how am I going to explain that name? And, but spirit will get really aggressive with me if I don't get their hints. So all of a sudden, during the span of a week, everywhere I went, numerous times, people would walk up to me and say, hi, I changed my name and it was the best thing I ever did. Hmm. I mean, like on the street, wow! in the grocery store, it was like just random. People are saying, I changed my name and you should change your name. And I'm like, what? So it got so bad. I finally accepted Etheria in 99. And then my life changed, shifted the day that I accepted it. But anyway, but to go back to 98. Um, so I was, you know, this name was spoken to me. Taos started appearing everywhere I went. And I'm like, what in the hell is a Taos? I don't even know what a Taos is. Um, a friend finally told me, I think it's a town in New Mexico. And I'm like, well, why? I don't care. I'm in Los Angeles doing the Hollywood thing. And I, I don't care about New Mexico. And, and then all that took off. But um, so at that point, I was living in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and one night, Totally out of the blue. I was taken. I wasn't expecting it. There was nothing. I went to bed that night. And the next thing I know, I'm in a UFO with aliens. Mm. And they're taking me somewhere. And now, what was interesting. Oh, and one of your prior guests confirmed this. And I'm forgetting which guest it was. Maybe you'll remember. But it was one of your recent guests. The person mentioned something that when I was watching them being interviewed, I went, oh, my God, mm -hmm. because I'm suddenly from the Hollywood Hills where you don't expect this kind of thing to happen. I'm suddenly in a UFO and I'm a very emotional person. Um, I feel a lot in uh, I don't hold back on things. But when I was in this ship with these ETs. I had no emotions. Mm. All my emotions were shut off. So one of your guests just mentioned that because when I heard the person say it, I'm like, oh my God, that confirms it. Um, I suddenly was pure logic. I, I, I was just logical. I was scientifically minded. I had no emotions. It was, I was not afraid. I felt very comfortable, but neutral. Mm -hmm. And which is not like me. And I kind of remember thinking it was weird because it was like I was me, but I was not me because I kind of remember thinking this is strange for me. What you're describing is a podcast that I have not published yet. Maybe this is some cycle really? thing. I have not published it yet. I've recorded it, but I have not published it yet. When they were approached by the UFO, something happened to them and they just kind of were relaxed and didn't care. Weird. I'm, now I'm feeling, now I'm feeling something. It was like they was, and we were talking like maybe they had some kind of yeah, energy, no. energy beam on them that they just became like, okay, there's a UFO there. Like no big deal. Like it did something to yeah, them. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, because I, that's not me, published I mean, you can see, yeah, I mean, I, I know I'm getting a hit. I'm. Getting, so I'm getting a confirmation feeling uh, right now, but um, it was me. But mm -hmm. I go, this is so not. I mean, I remember kind of thinking, this is so not me, but it's okay. <laughs> it's just like you know, it's weird. So, anyway, so all my emotions were just shut off, right. and I'm just, I'm just left brain at that point. I'm just left brain, and uh, so they they take me and they take me to a laboratory underneath downtown Los Angeles. Okay. Wow. Now. Okay, keeping in mind, I'm still very logical. So I'm a very emotional, creative person, but I'm a, I am also a logical person. So I'm thinking, well, this is weird. I mean, I'm, thinking, I'm questioning everything. I'm like, this is weird. I go, aren't they supposed like? Shouldn't this stuff be in Roswell? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking out in the. I'm thinking New Mexico or desert or somewhere remote. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they're taking me underneath downtown Los Angeles. Can you describe what they looked like for us and maybe what the inside of the UFO looked like? I wish I could. I mean, keeping in mind, this was 22 years ago. Um, 
it's weird. It's like I can see it, but I can't see it. Um, I do. Well, you know what? I don't know that this is visual. This is. I think it's just a feeling. I think it's just a feeling because it, it is. It's been a long time, but um, I'm gonna say if I had to, I think they were a little more grays looking. Um, I don't. I don't. They didn't strike me in memory. You know, trying to think about it, they didn't strike me as like the Nordic blonde Pleiadian type. Um, I, I think they were a little more typical. I don't want to stereotype, but typical ET looking. Um, but it's hard to remember. I, I can't really remember it well, um, what they look like. I do kind of see, I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm kind of remembering like a dashboard type thing, but not normal. Like like a lot of lights and stuff. I'm, I'm kind of seeing that now that I think about it. But to be honest, the ship wasn't my focus. I mean, it's mm. it's. Um, I think I think I was just more like, what is going on and what mm. the heck and you know, um, and logically questioning stuff because I'm so I'm questioning everything we were doing. And so you know, so we're so we're down below downtown Los Angeles supposedly, and I'm like really you know, underneath Los Angeles, this is so, this is so not logical. And uh, a year or two, by the way, a year or two later at a party, I met up with somebody who was into my kind of stuff. And we got, I got talking about my experiences. And uh, the gal said to me, um, oh yeah, there's a lab underneath downtown LA. I know about it. I mean, she was like, very matter of fact. So she converted, she's like, no, you're not making that up. There is something down there. And then what I have found out since, and this does make sense from a really you know, a smart standpoint, is the, th the theory that I've heard is that what better place to put something like that than underneath a major city where people are distracted? You know, there's all the Hollywood stuff going on. There's the bars and the stuff and people aren't going to be looking down. Mm -hmm. So it's actually an easier way to be hidden than out somewhere remote where you can kind of be found easier. That's so that, it, that does make sense mm -hmm. to me now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I don't remember how we got down there or whatever. I just, it's like, it's choppy. So I remember being in the ship with them, my emotions being cut off. Suddenly we're underground. And now and they're showing me ahead, um, and there was a, quite a few of them, uh, like these, you know, big test tubes. Well, I got to get up. <laughs> I mean, kind of like, you know, I mean, good-sized test tubes full of fluid um, with babies in them. Wow. And they were, uh, the, they were, I mean, they were hybrid babies that they were still growing in umbilical like umbilical i mean cords there was like um, there was kind of like an umbilical i remember kind of like umbilical cord type things mm -hmm. attached to them they're floating in fluid like they would be in a womb right um and there was a lot of them and still now you would i would think knowing me that i know is me i would have been a little bit horrified or you know i would have been a scare or something right um, but I wasn't because I'm still all logic. I was, and I, and I found it fascinating. And I will say this particular group, whoever they were, um, they treated me very much as an equal. Hmm. Um, they were, they were showing me what they were doing. Like I was a, com a comrade kind of hmm. a thing. And now, you know, this is kind of amusing now, but it didn't even dawn on me. Why are they showing me this stuff? I mean, who am I? And it wasn't until a couple of years ago when someone said to me, you know, did you ever wonder why they show you all these babies that they're making? They go, do you think that some of them were yours? Yeah, I was I thinking went, that. 
I didn't even dawn on I, I'm dense, I guess. It just didn't even dawn on me that maybe some of those were mine. And so, and the thing is, and this even goes back to the whole thing with my female system for years. Mm-hmm. Um, because my stuff were so irregular and didn't, you know, I wouldn't get them for, you know, good big lengths of time that it, 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 I wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. I like if I was preg if like if I was impregnated or something and then they took I wouldn't know. Mm, yeah, possibly if they were just harvesting eggs that maybe that would do yeah. some type of trauma to your system. Well, and to go back to that, I have I have some chronic health issues um that doctors including the Mayo Clinic for one of my issues. Mm-hmm. I've been to 110 doctors and healers and shamans for my neck and head issue that they can't explain. Um, my hormones, I was to tons of doctors for those. My blood sugar, I've been to a bunch of doctors. They can't figure out my blood sugar system either. But my endocrine system was so bizarre years ago that there was this very experienced MD in Los Angeles. I mean, he was in his 70s when I went to him. So he'd been a doctor for, you know, 40, 50 years. Um, he looked at my blood tests and he goes, because I had joked to him when I first met him. I go, I go mm-hmm. I'm not human because mm-hmm. my body was so weird. Mm-hmm. And he laughed. No, he laughed that off. Mm-hmm. But he ran some blood tests on me. He gets the results back and he says, this is impossible. These numbers for what your body is from what I can see you do to these numbers is not possible. He says, I think they must have gotten your blood work at Cedar Sinai. I think they got your blood work mixed up or something. This cannot be your blood. So he sent me back to Cedar Sinai, had a bunch more blood drawn. <laughs> Lucky me. Not the results come back in, he gets them, and he's like, I'm looking at his face, and he's like, the numbers were even weirder. Mm. He's like, I, he's like, I cannot explain your hormone levels and what I'm seeing here. And then he looks at me, this very conservative 70 something year old endocrinologist for many years. And he looks at me and he goes, you're an alien. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> I mean, was he joking? Like, he? Oh, yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, he smirked, but he's like, I can't the I don't know what to do with you for these numbers. I have no idea where to go. Hmm. And uh, but I've had so many doctors say to me that we can't we know there's something wrong. We can see that there's nerve damage in you and stuff. We know you're not making up your pain, Mm -hmm. but we cannot explain it, including Mm -hmm. the Mayo Clinic. Mm. So now. An interesting thing was, uh, let me decide, I don't, I'm skipping over again. Um, let's see, we were talking about the, oh, well, I don't want to go too far ahead, but well, in 2019, see. yeah, so, so, in, so in 1990, but in, uh, you know, but in 20, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but in 2019, uh, uh, yet another chiropractor confirmed that my head was really not human, it was odd. Mm-hmm. He said my skull's very odd. So, um, but so in, so 1998, so they take me down to the first group, took me uh, underneath downtown LA. They showed me these babies in the test tubes. I'm, I was fascinated by what I saw. Didn't dawn on me that maybe some of them were mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then the next thing I knew, I was back in bed. Right. I think I don't remember getting, I don't, I don't remember getting from the lab back. Um, and then about a week or two later, uh, yeah, probably, yeah, but a week or two later, another group came for me. Uh, not good. This second group, not benevolent. So, um, and I don't know how I knew that they weren't. I just knew that they weren't because... All of a sudden, you know, these like I'm seeing light, really bright lights come shining in through my windows. Um, but I was struck with 
absolute soul-wrenching fear. Um, dread, I, I was petrified. So I, uh, I just knew I don't want to go with these people. I, I really cannot go with these people. Please don't let them know I'm here. So I, I remember being on my floor, like face down. I'm, so, I'm trying not to make noises, but I'm crying. And I'm begging God, don't let them know I'm here. Please let them, you know, don't let them know I'm here. And uh, I felt just the fear, the fear was just horrendous. And then I blacked out and I don't, I don't remember anything. I just, the next morning I suddenly I'm two again and I, I don't remember that. So I don't remember anything from that session. Mm -hmm. I think I'm glad I have a feeling I'm glad I don't remember anything from that session, mm -hmm. but the feeling that I had, and I can't prove this either. I, I can't really prove any of it, but um, is that the second group wanted to know what the first group showed me. Mm. That's the strong feeling that I had. They they were curious about what I'd been shown. Right. So they wanted to get the info out of me and, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's what I think happened. Mm -hmm. Now, luckily, um, every abduction since then has been um, benevolent. Mm -hmm. So there's only that one group that I remember being really negative. Um, although I will admit, Something that happened last month was a little concerning. So I wouldn't necessarily call that totally benevolent, but mm -hmm. but overall, the, the vast majority of things have been benevolent. Um, one time in Albuquerque, I went willingly. Uh, I remember uh, standing in my, I had a house, I owned a house in Albuquerque at that time. And uh, this was in the, well, say I owned that house from May. I bought it in May 2010 and then I sold it October 2014. So it was somewhere in those years. Mm -hmm. um, I remember standing in my backyard in my pajamas. Thank God I, I had pajamas on that mm -hmm. night. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's silly because I'm thinking, gee, thank God I have pajamas on. Mm -hmm. But, there were times when once they got me, I'd get on a table anyway, so it really didn't matter. But um, I stood up in my backyard with my arms up as the ship was overhead, and I very willingly went in. So I remember that night. Um, I woke up the next morning with, on this, my left wrist, um, I mean, you can't, it's gone now, but like right here on my left wrist, there's a little circular burn after that willing going up in the sky night. Um, and I woke up the next morning and I go, well, that's kind of weird. When did I get the burn? You know, and I, could, I, I, I must've touched something in my oven or something. Mm -hmm. And then as that day went on, I started remembering the night before stuff more. Um, and then one, or, but that, but I'm still trying, I'm still very logical. So I'm still trying to explain this burn away as something stupid, like on a hot stove, mm -hmm. keeping in mind, I had gone like this the night before out my yard. So, um, a day or two later, I don't remember going anywhere, but I woke up that morning with a burn on this wrist mm -hmm. that in the exact same spot on that wrist, same circular burn. And they line and they put, when I put my wrist together, they, they lined up. Um, so I must've been taken again. And I just don't remember that night at all. I believe that you've seen UFOs that are, have been cloaked. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, I hadn't heard, um, I hadn't even heard, I didn't know about cloaking until it happened to me. So um, I, you know, of course, this story, what happened today was so cool. Mm. It, I, I love when this stuff happens. So for those of you who are now watching, yeah. earlier this morning, um, you know, Jeff emailed me and he asked if I was able to find this UFO picture that I had taken in December 2005 in Albuquerque the first time I lived there. And I didn't, you know, this was pre-smartphone. It was pre-data backup that I currently have. So um, 
I could not easily find this picture and I gave up and it's probably on a CD somewhere. So I told Jeff, you know, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to find this picture. A few hours go by. All of a sudden, I get this random email from Shutterfly mm. um, saying, here's your memories from 15 years ago. Mm. And uh, I had just weeks ago reactivated my old Shutterfly account that I didn't even know I still had. Um, and it was hooked up to an old email address that's gone. So Shutterfly had to kind of jump through hoops to give me my old account back. So, uh, so I just reactivated this Shutterfly weeks ago, but haven't used it in years and didn't even know I actually had uploaded much stuff to it. So anyway, so earlier today, I told Jeff, no, I don't have this picture. And uh, get this email. Here's your memories from 15 years ago. So I'm like, oh, well, let me just click. I'm, this is 2005. I'm curious. So I'm clicking. There's the UFO picture. I'm like, thank you. Mm. I mean, my, my unseen friends, they come through. <laughs> I mean, yeah. seriously, I cannot explain this today. It was like, ask and you shall receive. I need that photo. And it gets emailed to me. Right. Like, Whoa! Right. So anyway, but the way that photo came about um, is I had gotten a, uh, a Nikon camera that uh, and my new Nikon camera. And uh, I just took it was a beautiful, clear day in uh, no clouds, blue sky, December 27th of 2005 in Albuquerque. So I'm facing the Sandia Mountains, um, which are known for UFO activity, mm -hmm. as, as are the Manzano Mountains. Um, but my naked eyes didn't see anything. I'm just seeing beautiful, clear sky, nice day. So what I did is I had the Nikon and I just wanted to see what the different settings on the camera did so i didn't move the camera i just would take a picture turn the setting i just did like six different shots of you know just to compare didn't see anything go back to my apartment I'm, i upload the pictures onto my laptop and it's like you know nice shot nice shot nice shot what the heck is that nice shot whoa mm -hmm. <laughs> so this one frame in the middle of like six or seven of them had this thing in the frame that I'm like, I go, what is that thing? So I'm zooming, you know, I'm zooming in and I'm like, okay, what is that? It doesn't look, I don't know. It doesn't look, it doesn't look like a balloon. It doesn't look like a, it's not a plane. It's not a helicopter. Mm -hmm. What is that thing? And, um, and then, you know, you, uh, and I sent, Jeff today, you know, a zoom in of it. And it's kind of, it's kind of teardrop shaped silver, kind of teardrop this way, but a little bit, it's a little bit angular teardrop. And what's interesting is on the zoomed up version, you kind of see that it's moving the air. I don't know if you noticed this, Jeff, but mm -hmm. it's kind of moving the air around it. Like it's got like it's putting out energy, kind of like, you know, heat from the pavement in the summertime where it makes that like squiggly lines. You can see that it's moving the air around it. Um, and uh, back then, um, Shirley MacLaine uh, had on her website a lot of metaphysical stuff because she's mm -hmm. very into all this. And um, so I, I didn't know who to send the picture to back then. Um so I go, let me, let me send it to Shirley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let, me see if she, let me see what she thinks. So I sent it like so I sent it to her people. And uh they thought the picture was good enough, intriguing enough. Um, they go, can we send this to some um researchers that we work with in Mexico and have this analyzed? So I go, sure, you know, send my picture away. And um now I never did get the verdict back on it. Mm -hmm. I just kind of forgot about it. But she did end up putting my story and my pictures on her website for quite a few years. She oh, had wow. it up there. And then um, Shirley has redone her website about a year, a couple of years ago. So she's taken all this stuff down now. Um, it's devoted to her acting career and stuff now instead. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but I didn't, I, at that point, I didn't know that your eyes couldn't see a UFO, but that it might be there. And so, you know, and my, and, you know, and what, and what I say to people who just say, well, you know, it's a balloon or something, I go, well, if it was a balloon, I would have caught it in other frames. 
It's not like it's moving that fast that going click, click, click. I wouldn't have caught it more. And I don't did. It's only in one particular frame that I took in order. Hmm. So I, I really don't think it's a balloon or something you can just easily logically write off. And then, um, so then I started learning. So then I found with time, I did find out that they can cloak themselves so that they're right there and we just don't see them. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is, this is kind of funny because, uh, I was having this thing happen and it happens sometimes when I'm driving, which is not the safest situation, but I will feel my consciousness pulled out through my forehead. It's kind of that sensation. And I zone out in stuff. And, uh, and, and then years ago, I was told during a reading with another psychic, uh, I didn't mention that this happens to me, but the psychic brought this up. They go, they go, they're, the ETs are communicating with you when you feel your consciousness pulled out through your forehead. And I'm like, oh, I have that happen. And, um, and she's like, they're, they're the, when you feel that, they're there. So what, so, so that, you know, I was told that. So I'm driving to Sony Pictures Entertainment one day where I worked at the time. And I'm on Beverly Boulevard in the morning and it started to happen again. And I'm like, aha, I go, I know you're there. <laughs> I've learned. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I got feisty and I'm, I'm in my car yelling, going, I know you're there. Let me see you. Gosh, darn it. I want to see you. Just let show me yourselves. I know you're there. So bloop. I mean, suddenly it was just this quick flash of a craft mm -hmm. and then it was gone. Mm. And I went, okay, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you comply. Thank you. But I knew, you know, I'm glad I'm right. Mm -hmm. But they, they did actually, because I was demanding so angrily that I go, I know you're there. I want to see you. Um, they did actually quickly, like just, I mean, it was just that fast showed me and then they were gone. Um, so, uh, you know, and then and that this was years ago. And then, so since then I have learned that, yeah, this is a known phenomenon and it's mm. not so weird. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. You are a medium and a trance channeler. If someone wants to learn about what you do, do you have a website or how does someone, you know, if they want to contact you, how do they do that? I do. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> my friends tell me I'm in too many places. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm losing my voice. I'm talking too loud. Um, I do have a, it's a blog website. It's hodgepodge, but I have one. So it's bri bridge for the number four bridge for spirit dot wordpress dot com. Mm -hmm. um, I am here on YouTube uh, mm -hmm. under Etheria four four four. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, psychic underscore Etheria. I'm on, tw uh, well, Twitter's more political stuff. You probably don't want to read my Twitter. Um, <laughs> Facebook, I mean, I'm, I'm everywhere, but I, yeah, I have a blog and everything. What about Facebook? But I, I, so, uh, on Facebook, I'm just Etheria. Um, but, uh, I started, what happened is I, in the year 2000, so 1998 is when stuff really started picking up. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to Taos for the first time. I had extremely powerful experiences in Taos. Um, Taos is magical. And um, then in 2000, I was under hypnotic regression um, to do some past life work to try to clear out some of the pain problems that I have because because my problems are very past life connected also. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened is, so I'm just, I was hypnotized by a, he was a new, this is kind of funny. He was a new hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. So he was actually practicing on me. Um, in, so, but he did hypnotize me. So he was able to get me under and we're in the middle of some past life stuff. And all of a sudden, this is the year 2000. I was shoved out of my body totally. Uh, the me that I know as Etheria was over here. And these two different groups of beings started speaking through me. And I had absolutely no control over what they were. I had no control over my body. I was totally helpless. Um, 
I was over here, you know, I'm going to show my age, but I, you know, I grew up watching Welcome Back, Cotter. Mm -hmm. So I was like Horseshack. So mm -hmm. I'm over here going, oh, 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 because <laughs> I wanted to ask questions, mm -hmm. but I couldn't stop them. I couldn't ask a question. I'm totally helpless. The poor, the poor um, hypnotherapist, brand new guy, what a break in for his career. Um, he didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm because he wasn't expecting this. And so anyway, the two groups of beings, they started talking about stuff I hadn't even heard of at that point. So they started talking about uh, Lemuria, uh, the lost continent of Mu. Um, they said that I lived on Lemuria. Um, they said, uh, Oh, they, this is interesting. Now, in retrospect, um, so in 2000, I had not heard of the whole 2012 Mayan calendar thing mm -hmm. yet. I was very ignorant about that. So they, they didn't mention Mayan calendar, or anything, but they said, these are their exact words. In 12 years, your true work is going to become important. So... Uh, you know, when all of this ended finally and, and they pulled out of my body and I came back in, I'm like, what's happening in 12 years? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to start looking up 2012 is something supposed to happen. And then I found out about the whole Mayan calendar thing and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was interesting that they said in 12 years, they didn't say in 2012, they didn't mention the Mayan calendar. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first time that I ever channeled and i thought it was like a one-time thing mm -hmm. i didn't i you know i was like well that was really cool but what was that mm -hmm. um but it made me curious so uh somehow i don't remember how now i found out about a group in los angeles that was they would meet like once a week or something for like these channeling events mm -hmm. Because I, I, I didn't even hear that. I didn't know about the term channeling per se. Mm -hmm. um, so I found out about this event. I went one night to just observe. I was just in the audience. Mm -hmm. And um, people were in trance and they were doing channeling and stuff. But all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in the audience just watching. And the next thing I know, I go, I'm thinking I'm starting to feel funny. I go, I'm starting to feel funny. What's going? I'm like, boom. Mm. <laughs> I was gone and I started channeling. I took over the whole event. They all stopped and they're looking at me mm. and um, I don't remember any of it now. Mm. And uh, so I come out of it and all the people who were supposed to be the ones channeling go, do you know what you have? <laughs> but do you know what you just did? Mm. And I'm like, no, I can't. I'm like, I don't know. I was here and then I'm not. And, I'm like, you know. and uh, they go, you need to learn. There's, you know, there's a class that you need to get into because you clearly have an ability. So, mm -hmm. so um, I got hooked up with a wonderful channeling teacher in Los Angeles, Sean Randall. Um, so that I started taking uh, some training with her um, that was really, really helpful uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and then as part of that channeling class, and I think this probably happened in early 2002, um, uh, we each, you know, uh, she wanted to hook us up with our main spirit guides as part of our gatekeepers who would control who came through. So one person each week of the group of 10 would uh, have a session on a Ouija board with Sean, her guide, Torah, and then you um, to try to meet your main guide and your gate, your gatekeeper. So uh, I was the last person to go. So it was the 10th week. It's my turn. Everybody else had really cool stuff happen, you know, and their guides are coming through. and It's awesome. And so I get up there and our hands are on the planchette, the Ouija board. And she calls in, she's in trance and she's calling in. I think she was in trance, I'm never, you know, um, <clears throat> trying to get my guide to show up. Nothing's happening. And nothing's happening. And, you know, 
And I'm, you know, I'm starting to get upset. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be the only one who doesn't have anything happen. And, you know, I have no guide. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, oh, what was me? And then all of a sudden, to, you know, all of a sudden, it's like, going. I'm like, whoa. You know, I go, I'm not doing this. And she, we're, you know, I, I was, we, we were definitely not moving it. And so, so somebody else is, is writing down the letters and stuff. Well, this is where it's kind of funny, is uh, everybody else had... Okay, I'll call them normal guides. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I don't want to insult my guides because the, I mean they're awesome. But <laughs> others like I mean when I say normal guides, um, one of my you know one of my good friends, she had a wonderful uh, Chinese guide who came through. Um, you know, she's got a Chinese guide. Uh, actually, she was the first one who channeled one night, and so her her guide was speaking in Chinese. I'm in trans, I don't know Chinese, but I'm translating the Chinese. Mm. So that was fascinating. Yeah, that was, that was really cool. But, um, so, you know, like she had a Chinese guide, other people had loved ones in spirit who were kind of their guide, you know, like, you know, regular, like human being type guy. Mine, we're so going around, all of and it starts spelling out that her name is Alora, her name was Alora, A-L-O-R-A. And she starts talking, um, she starts saying that I'm extraterrestrial connected and that they want to work with me. And wrote out Billy, look up Billy Meyer. I had never heard of Billy Meyer. I didn't know about his story at all. Um, mentioned, uh, and uh, now the interesting thing was, uh, Please, I guess I, I may be foggy on this. People may have to look this up. But I think the original term for, for Pleiadians um, it was actually Pleiarans. Hmm. So the board wrote out, wrote out um, Pleiarans. And, uh, and then look up Billy Meyer. And I'm like, okay. You know, and, then, and then I looked up Billy Meyer and I read his story. Um, but... What, what is interesting is, uh, uh, you know, they, they start talking. Oh, I know. They start talking about that they want to work with me if I'm willing to work with them, and but that I needed to give them permission. And um, I made some joke. I don't remember now exactly what I said, but I was being a smarty pants, and I joked about abductions or something. And... Uh, she got mad at me. Alora got irked with my making light of it. Mm. And she's like, uh, we don't, we don't do something like we don't do such things. And if that's what you're looking for, um, we're not interested or something. I mean, she reprimanded me for making light of, a. you know, she's like, we don't abduct people. That's not how we work. Mm. And if you're going to make jokes about it, then, uh, you need to rethink it. I mean, I got, you know, I got yelled at by Ouija board. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to offend you. And, um, but you know, it was interesting because uh, she did make it very clear on the board that I, they needed permission to work with me. And, um, and then, uh, and then I will say ever, you know, ever since, so that was early two thousands. Um, and then ever since then, as far as I can tell, the the uh, when I have been taken, um, it's been at least neutral, if not downright benevolent type stuff. Um, and I can say that because uh, they, uh, I, I'll go through periods of time where not much goes on. And then suddenly there'll be a rash of stuff going on again. And like I had like last month was an November was an active month. Um, I th I think I was taken at least twice last month. Mm -hmm. um, and I had some other weird things happen. But during uh, was it the February? Yeah. So in uh, February of 2019, taking that was when I lived up in Powake. Um, I remember I'm on a table 
in their ship at that point. And I was naked and I was cold. And I, re- I remember thinking, can't they like put some heat in this thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm cold. I'm free- I remember thinking, geez, I'm cold. Mm-hmm. You know, put some or put a towel, you know, blanket on me, something. Because I was stark naked in that one. Um, but I clearly remember, I think it was three fingers. They were long fingers. I want to say three fingers, maybe four. It wasn't five. It was three or four. I think three. But I remember like these three long fingers, like really gently being on my finish because they were doing, they were doing stuff to my, they often do things to my head. So, but I remember these very gentle fingers on my finish and uh, that they were uh, trying to, and it was very, it was very loving kind of. I mean, they don't have feelings, but it was like they were trying to show me we're not going to hurt you. Right. Where, um, yeah. And um, and then, uh, oh, and then the more recent one in November, I'm on the grass outside somewhere and these two uh, beings scamper up to me. They kind of walked on all four. They were like... Hey, it's really hard to describe what they looked like because they kind of looked like grays, but yet they, they scampered on all fours. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, they were, they were very lizardish, but not and scampered anyway, but I'm laying on the ground and one whose name was, I was told the name was daddy. um, If I'm hearing that right. Mm -hmm. Um, was petting my arm, going, you know, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Um, So they they often will try to let me know they're not going to hurt me. Um, But they do do invasive things to my head with metal stuff on my head and things. And, you know, so Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's weird. So it's like they are benevolent, but in theory, should they be just taking me like that? If, so I think there's there's different groups. Like Alora, who came through with her people, who were Pleiadian, um, I don't think they're the ones that necessarily I go up with on a regular basis. I think mm-hmm. they're different. Yeah. All right. Well, we're running out of time. But before we go, oh, wow. yeah, we've gone over an hour. I told you it goes really, I don't My know God, I told I, you, it goes fast. It goes really fast. And I didn't give you a chance to hardly say anything. Oh, I'm that's sorry. okay. It's about you. It's not about me. They don't want to hear me talk. They want to hear your story. So before we go, do you have one last message that you can share with us? Um, okay, this is actually, well, this is uh, not extraterrestrial related. But um, uh, and Andy, uh, I, uh, this is an Andy Gibb thing. Hmm. And uh, I met Andy Gibb uh, when I was like 11 years old, in 1977 or so. I met Andy when he was first starting out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was 19, yeah, I was 11 years old. Shadow dancing. And, um, so I went to, yeah, <laughs> uh, and he was uh, very, very sweet. He was a very sweet, lovely human being. I missed him. So so anyway, so years ago, I went to his grave in Los Angeles. Hmm. And um, I was at his grave and I was talking to him, hoping that he could hear me. And uh I asked him, I felt, I thought I felt something. Mm -hmm. So I go, I go, are you here? And I go, do you have a message for us down here? And he said, love with all your heart and you will be healed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I went home that night. I had a dream and I hear him singing and I hear, um, you are this dreamer's only dream, heaven's angel. And, um, so he visited me that night in my sleep, too. Wow. But that message from Andy of love with all your heart and you will be healed, I think is a good way to end this. Yeah, that's a great message. And you have an amazing story. And I really appreciate you sharing it with me, being vulnerable and being open and just giving us you know, so much detail. I told you about my hormones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all better now, but I mean, this is, you know, this is many years ago. Right. Um, um, 
But so. yeah, I have, I mean, I have, uh, I, I have, uh, uh, cause I, I am a ghost hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some really cool, uh, ghost stories. Uh, there's Taos weird stories. I, mm -hmm. I have a lot of other stuff that I'm into. So right. there's, well, a, yeah. Um, are I you can talk for days. Well, are you ever considering writing a book? Yeah. In fact, I was, uh, I've started it and stopped it and started it and stopped it numerous times. And mm -hmm. then uh, a fellow medium actually last Sunday, um, who doesn't know me is a new kind of a new friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, he's like spirits saying, uh, what about that book? Yeah. You should. So yeah. yeah, yeah, they're they're on. I think you should. You know, I had a. I, if you go back to one of my very first podcast was with an author. I can't even remember his name. It was so long ago. But um, he's written like twenty something books. Oh, and he wow. was trying to get me to write a book, and he said, "All you have to do every day is just write for fifteen minutes." And he said, "In fifteen oh. minutes, you'll write five hundred words." And I don't know what, how many days it well, would take, but you know, after a, a few months, you'll have a book. There's a wonderful, yeah, well, that's true. There's a wonderful story. Um, uh, some author was on a Today Show or Good Morning America years mm -hmm. ago, and this guy was an attorney. By by, his day job was very busy attorney, but you know, he got into his like uh, 40s or so, getting near middle age, and he'd always wanted to write a book. But uh, it was always kind of like a back dream of his. Mm -hmm. But um, he's like, I got to do it. You know, but I, you know, so what he did is because he had, you know, he needed to keep his day job. So he would go into his law firm um, at like dawn, every, like five, four or five in the morning every day. Mm -hmm. He'd write for an hour and then put it aside and then be a lawyer all day long. So it took him a while to do it. But he after you know a year or two, he got the book written. It ended up becoming a bestseller on the net. You know, like literally one of the top. I'm forgetting what his name was now, but uh, not John Grisham. It's somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so a little bit at a time. And I, I actually have a movie idea and a TV show idea. Mm -hmm. um, and because of my Hollywood background, I, um, I probably should start just trying to write those. And I, mm -hmm. I have discipline issues. Well, that's okay. But you're right. If you focus on just a little bit at a time, yeah, fifteen you know, minutes, you can get it done. Yeah. All right, Ethereum. Yeah, I, I can probably commit to fifteen. Yeah, you can. Okay. Definitely. Here's blue. Hello. Did you see my podcast on cats? Yeah. Well, they're very extraterrestrial. Did you catch the one I had with the um with the cats a couple weeks ago? I think something sounds familiar. With Paul, uh, um, I'm about to go, let me go look. Again. The history of cats within witchcraft and oh. paganism and okay, no, uh, yeah, you should check it out. That. It's a very fascinating, um, very fascinating um, story. The guy wrote this book, and it's the it's in the voice of the cat. His cat is telling the story, but he he had all this oh, cool. research of cats. Well, isn't it um, I, I have two. I have two cats, and uh, I am convinced they are transmitting data back to a mothership. The way they look at me, <laughs> I just you know. But well, isn't it uh, the isn't it the Lyrans who are supposedly feline-looking beings? I don't know. You may have saw that podcast of mine where the guy had an abduction, and and the woman was uh, kind of cat-like. She was like half cat, half human. Yeah, there's there is a race. I want to say it's the Lyrans, L Y R A N S, that are feline, a feline in feature. Right. Yeah, that might have been. I mean, he didn't he didn't have a name, but he talked about it. Anyways, Etheria, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I wish you a wonderful evening, and hopefully we can get back on. Hopefully we can have another podcast together. Yeah, and I can actually let you say something. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank right. you. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.